Hello and welcome to the history of Atlantis. Atlantis, also called the Lost City of the Ancients and the City of the Ancestors. Atlantis is a city ship built by the ancients several million years ago. It has approximately the same internal space as found in Manhattan. The ancients left the Milky Way galaxy several million years ago for the Pegasus Galaxy, taking Atlantis with them and settling on a planet they named Lantia, which became their new capital. Millions of years later, after the Lantians, the name the Ancients came to be known by in the Pegasus Galaxy, submerged the city to protect it from the Wraith, and returned to Earth through the Stargate. Over the ages, their story inspired the Tari myth of Atlantis. Atlantis was built 30 million years ago on Earth, on the island known as Santorini. The city was later moved to the continent of Antarctica, which at the time was situated much closer to the planet's equator. When a plague similar to the one created by the Ori spread through the Milky Way galaxy, Atlantis was launched from its home, bound for the Pegasus galaxy. A small outpost inhabited by a small number of ancients was left behind on Earth, likely because they were infected and those who were departing the Milky Way didn't want to bring the plague to the Pegasus galaxy. Another ancient called Amera remained on Santorini in a stasis pod when the rest of her people left Earth in Atlantis. Upon arriving in the Pegasus Galaxy, they decided to settle on the planet Lantia. Once there, the ancients created a new Stargate network and seeded the galaxy with life, just like they had once done in the Milky Way. Soon, life began to flourish where once there was none. Some time later, during the war with the Wraith, several Hive ships destroyed all ancient colonies until Atlantis was the only one left. Hive ships went to Atlantis and started the first siege of Atlantis. The ancients managed to defeat each wave of hive ships, but they were impossibly outnumbered. The ancient council decided to submerge the city underwater to protect it from the wraith attacks and intrusions. The city was submerged and held in place by a series of clamps on the sea floor, while the city's impenetrable shield maintained the atmosphere, and kept the Lantean Ocean at bay. Towards the end of the war with the Wraith, the ancient Janus rescued Dr. Elizabeth Weir from a puddle jumper that had been shot down, a jumper that was also a time machine, and also known as a time jumper, designed and built by Janus himself. It had accidentally transported Weir, Major John Shepard, and Dr. Reddick, Zelenka, back in time when they had been forced to evacuate Atlantis, only hours after arriving. In that timeline, the city's power failed shortly after the Atlantis expedition had arrived. The shields failed, and nearly everyone perished when the ocean flooded the city. Rodney McKay survived long enough to buy Weir, Shepard, and Zelenka time to escape, but eventually died in the flood waters himself. The Time Jumper transported the trio back in time, but a wraith attack shot the Jumper down, killing Shepard and Zelenka. Janice found Weir amid the wreckage and brought her back to Atlantis. During this time, it was decided by the Council to abandon the city and return to Earth via the Stargate. Unknown to the Council, however, Dr. Weir secretly stayed behind in stasis as part of a plan devised by Janus. She rotated the city's zero-point modules every 3.3 thousand years, so that when her expedition team, or rather the second expedition team from the current timeline, rediscovered Atlantis in 10,000 years' time, the shield would hopefully have enough power to continue to hold back the oceans so that they wouldn't drown like they had in her timeline. Janus also programmed a fail-safe mechanism into the city so that if power reached a critical level, the clamps holding the city to the ocean floor would release, 
and Atlantis would rise to the surface once more. Furthermore, the Stargate was programmed to accept incoming wormholes from only Earth, so that the city and Dr. Weir would remain safe until its rediscovery by the Atlantis Expedition. When the Atlantis Expedition arrived in July 2004, they started to explore the city until Dr. Rodney McKay discovered that the city's zero-point modules were nearly depleted, and that the Atlantis shield would fail, causing a massive flood. After searching Athos for a safe refuge due to the inevitable shield failure, the search team eventually brought the Athosians back after a wraith culling occurred. When the team and the refugees returned, Janus's fail-safe mechanism activated and Atlantis rose to the surface just as the shield finally ran out of power and failed. With Atlantis safe from the risk of flooding, the expedition continued to settle down and set up home for both themselves and the Athosian refugees. Thank you for watching the history of the ancient city of Atlantis, part one. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can. If you already have, thank you, and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Hello, and welcome to the History of Atlantis, Part 2. In 2006, SG-1, except for Teal, arrived in Atlantis on the Odyssey, as a step in their way against the Ori. Samantha Carter and Cameron Mitchell took Dr. Rodney McKay on a mission to connect the Stargate to the Supergate back in the Milky Way galaxy, preventing its further use by the Ori, at the same time destroying a hive ship and an Ori warship. Meanwhile, Dr. Daniel Jackson and Vala Maldoran Access the ancient database in hope of discovering the location of the Sangral, a weapon against the Ori designed by Merlin. However, the ascended ancient Morgan Le Fay, who masqueraded as the database's holographic interface, was stopped by the others before she could reveal it. In 2007, after a massive preemptive strike on Asuras by Earth's new battlecruiser, the Apollo, the Asurians launch a retaliatory attack on Atlantis. They sent a satellite housing a Stargate to Lantia, and after dialing it from Asuras, unable to evacuate by Stargate, and unable to fully dissipate the beam after submerging the city, the expedition used the Stargate to leave Lantia, the recently discovered mobile drilling platform located on the ocean's floor gave Atlantis the power boost it needed to lift off as the expedition only had one zero-point module instead of three, which the city was designed to use. The shield had to be lowered so that the power could be diverted to the Stargate for the critical first few moments of the fight. As the shield was being raised after the initial phase, however, the Asurian's beam grazed the side of the main tower, causing serious damage to the power conduits. Because of this, Atlantis dropped out of hyperspace prematurely and far from the new intended homeworld, with the city's single zero-point module nearly depleted, having only 24 hours of energy left. With the aid of a replacement ZPM stolen in a daring raid on Asuras, the city eventually settled on M35117. During that same year, the ninth chevron in the Atlantis database was discovered, and the Icarus base was built in the Milky Way to research into dialing it. This later mounted with the help of Eli Wallace in the successful dialing of the Destiny days after Atlantis's return to Earth. In 2008, the hybrid Michael Kinmore used a puddle jumper in conjunction with a stolen IDC and a number of hybrids to infiltrate Atlantis. He combined Wraith and ancient technology and managed to create a force field with similar results as a Wraith stunner disbanding anyone who attempted to access the control tower. His goal was to capture Taylor's son. Ronan eventually escaped from his original capture as he was in the Stargate operations when the stun field was established. However, Michael was able to overpower and render Ronan unconscious. This distraction allowed Taylor to escape. Michael activated Atlantis's self-destruct in an attempt to draw Taylor out. 
but it was unsuccessful. He then attempted to retreat with the DNA of Taylor's son that he had already taken, vowing to clone him. In the meantime, Dr. Rodney McKay and Lieutenant Colonel John Shepard planned to use a puddle jumper from the underwater jumper bay, dial the DHD, and use the unstable vortex to destroy Michael's jumper, thus rendering the field inactivated and restoring Atlantis to its natural power. The plan succeeded, and Michael was forced to flee with Shepard in chase. As they battled on the outside of one of Atlantis's tower, Michael was able to throw Shepard over the side. But Taylor intervened and pushed Michael over the edge. His grip failing, Taylor kicked his hand from the edge, finally killing him in the fall. In early 2009, the Wraith Todd contacted Atlantis and told them that his underling had mutinied and managed to use several ZPMs acquired during the destruction of Athurus to create a superhive. He urged the expedition to attack it before it becomes a major threat to them. The Tauri sent the Daedalus to confront the hive ship, but the ZPM-powered vessel proved itself an impressive opponent, crippling the Daedalus before making a sudden and inexplainable jump into hyperspace. The expedition later found out that the hive ship was on its way to Earth. Both the Apollo and the new Tauri ship, the Sun Tzu, failed to destroy the vessel before it reached Earth. Shepard interrogated Todd for the location of more ZPMs, which Major Lauren and his team were able to locate. Atlantis, now with her full complement of three ZPMs, was sent to the original home in a last-ditch effort to defend it. Dr. Carson Beckett flew the city until the city's hyperdrive failed at the edge of the Milky Way. Dr. Zelenka proposed activating a highly experimental and potentially dangerous drive based on the same wormhole technology as the Stargate. With it, they could potentially reach Earth in seconds. When Atlantis arrived, it placed itself between the Superhive and Earth in order to buy Stargate Command more time. Atlantis took the brunt of the Hive's assault and launched a barrage of drone weapons in retaliation. The sheer force of the Hive ship's weapons pushed the city ship into Earth's atmosphere placing severe strain on the shield. Quickly losing power, the only options were to adjust Atlantis's course or keep firing at the enemy ship. Richard Woolsey chose to keep firing. The SGC eventually succeeded in destroying the Hive ship, but Atlantis was now forced to land on Earth, risking burning up during re-entry. The city was able to cloak just before their approach to San Francisco Bay and the area in which they landed was placed under a naval quarantine to prevent ships from passing through the cloaking field. After arriving on Earth, repairs to the city began. It was quickly determined that the wormhole drive couldn't be fixed, but that the hyperdrive was repairable with several weeks of work. However, the IOA refused to let Atlantis off Earth at first, pushing the President to give them full control of Atlantis as a sovereign state. With the ancient technology and drone weapons possessed by Atlantis, anyone who had control of it could demand anything of other countries and they'd be forced to comply. If the IOA gained full control, they'd eventually become the first world government. Due to the economic crisis, the President was also unable to supply Atlantis with a full military contingent if it went back to the Pegasus galaxy. Finally, the president reached a deal with Woolsey. If Woolsey could find a way to get the IOA to agree to let Atlantis leave, the president would allow him to have a small team of military advisors to aid in protecting the Pegasus galaxy. After the IOA started to shut down the Atlantis expedition with plans to dismantle the city, Woolsey General Jack O'Neill and Colonel Samantha Carter began conspiring to get Atlantis back to Pegasus. As head of Homeworld Security, O'Neill officially took command of Atlantis as it had fell in American territorial waters, while anyone wanting to transfer was transferred to the George Hammond under the command of Carter. While in control of the city, O'Neill used his command of it to secretly restock the city and have repairs done to vital systems such as hyperdrive. Using half the Air Force, Dr. Bill Lee and his team from the SGC's entire maintenance section 
O'Neill was able to restore Atlantis's personnel to around 400, with about 100 of these being new Air Force personnel sent to replace civilian contractors. Woolsey didn't have time to replace. Eventually, rather than allowing the American military to have full control of Atlantis, the IOA agreed to allow it to return to Pegasus, at which time O'Neill restored command to Woolsey. Carter also allowed those who transferred to the George Hammond and wished to transfer back to do so. With Shepard and Beckett altering piloting, Atlantis took off on a nine-day journey for Lantia, followed close behind by the Daedalus, which saw the city off from a lower orbit along with the George Hammond. That last part is from Stargate Atlantis Homecoming, book one of the Legacy series by Joe Graham and Melissa Scott. It was not in the show. Thank you for watching the History of Atlantis Part 2. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can. If you already have, then thank you, and have a nice day. Bye-bye.